So the, the question is, why do we say AS is immune mediated? Well, so we have lots of pieces of evidence, but arguably the strongest is by changing the immune system, we get people better. So it's immune mediated. Maybe your question is asking, what's the difference between autoimmune and autoinflammatory, or what's the difference between autoimmune and immune mediated? Okay, so rheumatoid arthritis is presumably autoimmune. And we say rheumatoid arthritis is autoimmune because there's a blood test called an anti-CCP and another blood test called a rheumatoid factor. And they're both showing evidence that our body's immune system is making an immune response to the body. So that's autoimmune, okay? If you have Crohn's disease, we don't think that's autoimmune. We think it's an immune system to bacteria. So it's not a bac an immune response to the self. It's an immune response to that second genome. So autoimmune would be the wrong term. Immune mediated would be more accurate. And we think that axial spondyloarthritis is much more like Crohn's than it is like rheumatoid arthritis. So your doctor doesn't diagnose axial spondyloarthritis by showing that your body's making an immune response to your body. Okay. So the, the question is, should antibiotics be given to counteract this? So in this paper that we wrote in Nature Reviews Rheumatology, um, we talked about what are the implications for therapy if the hypothesis is true. And one approach would be an antibiotic, but that's an unlikely approach. One reason is that when you take the antibiotic, you're not targeting, you're destroying the good guys as well as the bad guys, and your bacteria are smart enough to become resistant. So if all of us started taking antibiotics, you might feel better for a day, a week, a month, but pretty soon those bacteria are gonna be even more recalcitrant. It's a little bit like taking prednisone for some of us. You know, for some things, taking prednisone is a miracle cure initially, but pretty soon you get dependent. If you take a narcotic for pain, you may feel marvelous initially, but over time you become resistant and antibiotics would surely be the same. So the, sometimes with a real severe flare of Crohn's, they, they, they will use antibiotics, but it's not a long-term solution. So as of right today, there is, in my opinion, no proof for anything, even though paradoxically, as I said, diet and the microbiome are unbelievably important. Furthermore, I might have a patient one day who's, who walks in and says, Doc, I found eating a chocolate bar makes me so much better. And the very next patient may come in and say, Doc, I found eating a chocolate bar makes me so much worse. So it's very empiric, which is a fancy word for trial and error. But it reminds me that I wanted to tell you about Viome. So, by full disclosure, I'm a collaborator with Viome, which is a company in New Mexico. I have zero financial interest. I have an intellectual interest with Viome, but not financial. Viome says diet's incredibly important, and diet is what changes the microbiome. But if we just study one person and we say, how does taking turmeric change your microbiome, we're not gonna get anywhere because from Monday to Tuesday, not only have you added turmeric, you've probably salted your potatoes more or something like that. So Viome says, we are going to get thousands of people and we're going to use machine learning to say, if we characterize the microbiome on thousands of people and get thousands of detailed diet information, we're going to be able to correlate eventually with enough statistical power what goes on with 
one person or, or one diet change with a change in the microbiome. So that's, um, that's the power of what we call big data or precision medicine. Um, Viome is going about doing this not by looking at the bacteria, but looking at the products that the bacteria make through RNA instead of DNA. So, you know, the basic code of life is we go from DNA to RNA to protein. We learn a lot by the DNA, but we learn more by the RNA, which translates the DNA. And we le learn even more by looking at what proteins are made. So Viome is trying to look at what RNAs from bacteria are in your poop, but they also look at the RNAs that are from you in the poop, and they're collecting diet information on thousands to try to understand. I don't know if this is going to succeed or not, and it's a commercial endeavor. So you can go and sign up for Viome, and I don't know what they charge, but they do charge. However, um, Viome wants to understand spondylitis, and they want to understand rheumatoid arthritis. And if you have spondylitis and you sign up, it is absolutely free. And I brought the pamphlets about the science of the microbiome, and they're out on the table, and how to participate. And um, we are trying to recruit individuals with rheumatoid arthritis, individuals with spondylitis, and the healthy people that are already working with Viome to try to characterize the RNA in their poop and see if we can correlate the diet. I'm pretty sure that uh, they're collecting diet histories, but also you photograph what you eat, and the, um, the recognition software, like facial recognition software, has gotten so good that we can learn a lot from a photograph of your lunch. But as I said, it's not perfect. It's not perfect in terms of portion and how much butter was there and this and that. But uh, this is really a noble start. And, and big data, big data is the concept that lots and lots and lots of information can help us out. And that's what we're, we're doing for precision medicine to get all this information about the genome that, you know, when you're going to characterize billions of bases, you need a computer that's very powerful. This is the same sort of idea of getting incredible gigabytes of data that we can then analyze and try to answer the question ultimately, which I hope we can do. So. So a lovely question. Um, I, I think there's at least one abstract that I saw in previewing the meeting that um, found women um, at least as common and certain aspects like iritis being more common. Although in my experience, the iritis has been more male than female by a slight amount. Um, I, I think that the spectrum of disease is different. So women, for example, may get more cervical disease than low back disease. And we used to say that the disease um, would always start at the lower back and move up. And so that was one reason why we weren't recognizing women. The, um, the reactive arthritis was the triad of non-gonococcal urethritis, so a discharge from the penis, and um, I, or red eyes, conjunctivitis, and an arthritis. So reactive arthritis, the, it's harder to recognize the discharge that we know in the penis to the female discharge. Um, so the cervicitis, or the vaginitis was more occult than the urethral discharge. So for that disease, it's easy to understand. 
And I think for spondylitis, it's that the sacroiliitis that was part of the New York criteria and the hallmark is perhaps less common in women than it is in men. Sure, so it's a lovely question. Um, you know, my, my research starts with B27 as the genetic factor and looks how that changes things with the recognition that I'm not explaining for everyone, but I hope if we can define the paradigm that accounts for B27, then we can figure out what it is in someone who's B27 negative. So um, we're, we're not explaining the disease for everybody, um, but we hope if we can understand the disease that accounts for the majority of people, we can extrapolate to those who are the atypicals in terms of the genetic factors. And someone who's African American has other genetic factors and environmental factors. And as I said earlier, that B27 gene is neither necessary nor sufficient. So you can get disease if you're negative, and you can get disease it, um, by having it doesn't mean that you're going to necessarily get disease. The inflammatory bowel disease you know, has much less uh, reaction or relationship to B27. So um, that. Studying that disease will help us, I think, understand the B27 negatives as well. Take a question now from our live stream audience. Barbara's asking, what criteria do you use in deciding to change biologics? When is it time to move on to the one? So <laughs> obviously a very essential question. Um, you know, I, I think most of us uh, employ a technique called shared decision making. So I used to say to my patients, um, how can I help you? Now I usually start with, what would you like to achieve today? What is it we should accomplish? So the first threshold for me as to whether we're going to change a biologic is if a patient says to me, this isn't working. If on the other hand, if a patient says, I'm satisfied with how I am, I can do most of my activities of daily living and life is enjoyable, I'm not gonna change. So it's a partnership. I, I tell my patients, I'm a waiter. And we have a buffet, and on our buffet are non-steroidal, sulfasalazine, methotrexate, anti-IL-17, anti-TNF, I can tell you how 100 people respond to each item on the buffet, but I can't tell you how you're going to respond. My job is to tell you sort of what it's like and what you can expect if you taste this, but I really don't know until we try it out. Please. Fantastic question. So first of all, it reminds me to, to say in my treatment paradigm, my scheme, it was for classic ankylosing spondylitis. And 
there's a, a different set of drugs that you could use if you have psoriatic spondylitis, and maybe a different set of drugs slightly if you have inflammatory bowel disease associated spondylitis. Um, an investigator uh, whose name I think is Orchard from the United Kingdom defined three types of arthritis with inflammatory bowel disease. There's the axial disease, and then there's the peripheral disease, and the peripheral disease can either correlate with the bowel activity or march to an independent drummer from the bowel activity. So sometimes you can have occult bowel inflammation that will respond, and other times um, it's going to march independently. And the only way to know with absolute certainty is to try. You may know that for inflammatory bowel disease, there's a, a biologic called vetaluzumab. And veto um, targets just the lymphocytes that go to the gut. So by blocking the lymphocytes from making it into the gut, the bowel gets better probably as consistently as an anti-TNF. But a lot of the non-gut manifestations, like the uveitis and the arthritis, don't get better. Sometimes they do, because sometimes the bowel disease correlates well with the joint and eye disease, and sometimes they're just marching independently. 